Anarchism and the Black Revolution, written by Lorenzo Comboa Irvin. Read by Sen Naomi Kirsch Schultz. Chapter 2, Part 1. Where is the black struggle, and where should it be going? Some, usually comfortable black middle-class professionals, politicians, or businessmen who rode the 1960s civil rights movement into power or prominence, will say there is no longer any necessity to struggle in the streets during the 1990s for black freedom. They say we have, quote-unquote, arrived and are now, quote, almost free, unquote. They say our only struggle now is to integrate the money or win wealth for themselves and members of their social class, even though they give lip service to, quote-unquote, empowering the poor. Look, they say, we can vote. Our black faces are all over TV and commercials and situation comedies. There are hundreds of black millionaires, and we have political representatives in the halls of Congress and state houses all over the land. In fact, they say, there are currently over 7,000 black elected officials, several of whom preside over the largest cities in the nation, and there is even a governor of a southern state who is an African-American. That's what they say. But does this tell the whole story? The fact is, we are in as bad or even worse shape, economically and politically, as when the civil rights movement began in the 1950s. One in every four black males are in prison, on probation, parole, or under arrest, at least one-third or more of black family units are now single parent families mired in poverty. Unemployment hovers at 18 to 25 percent for black communities. The drug economy is still the number one employer of black youth. Most substandard housing units are still concentrated in black neighborhoods. Blacks and other non-whites suffer from the worst health care, and black communities are still underdeveloped because of racial discrimination by municipal governments, mortgage companies, and banks who redline black neighborhoods from receiving community development, housing, and small business loans which keep our communities poor. We also suffer from murderous acts of police brutality by racist cops which has resulted in thousands of deaths and wounding and internecine gang warfare resulting in numerous youth homicides and a great deal of grief. But what we suffer from most and what encompasses all of these ills is that fact that we are an oppressed people. In fact, a colonized people subject to the rule of an oppressive government we really have no rights under this system except that which we have fought for, and even that is now in peril. Clearly, we need a new mass black protest movement to challenge the government and corporations and expropriate the funds needed for our communities to survive. Yet, for the past 25 years, the revolutionary black movement has been on the defensive due to co-optation, repression, and betrayals of the black liberation movement of the 1960s, today's movement has suffered a series of setbacks and has now become static in comparison. This may be because it is just now getting its stuff together after being pummeled by the state's police agencies and also because of the internal political contradictions which arose in the major black revolutionary groups like the Black Panther Party, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, as it was called in those days, and the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. I believe all were factors that led to the destruction of the 1960s black left in this country. Of course, Many blame this period of relative inactivity in the black movement on the lack of forceful leaders in the mold of Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Marcus Garvey, etc., while other people blame the quote-unquote fact that the black masses have allegedly become, quote, 
corrupt and apathetic, unquote, or just need the correct revolutionary line. Whatever the true facts of the matter, it can clearly be seen that the government, the capitalist corporations, and the racist ruling class are exploiting the current weakness and confusion of the black movement to make an attack on the black working class and are attempting to totally strip the gains won during the civil rights era. In addition, there is a resurgence of racism and conservatism among broad layers of the white population, which is a direct result of this right-wing campaign. Clearly, this is a time when we must entertain new ideas and new tactics in the freedom struggle. The ideals of anarchism are something new to the black movement and have never really been examined by black and other non-white activists. Put simply, it means the people themselves should rule, not governments, political parties, or self-appointed leaders in their name. Anarchism also stands for the self-determination of all oppressed peoples and their right to struggle for freedom by any means necessary. So what road is in order for the black movement? Continue to depend on opportunistic democratic hack politicians like Bill Clinton or Ted Kennedy, the same old group of middle-class sellout leaders of the civil rights lobby, one or another of the authoritarian Leninist sects who insist that they and they alone have the correct path to quote-unquote revolutionary enlightenment, or finally building a grassroots revolutionary protest movement to fight the racist government and rulers. Only the black masses can finally decide the matter whether they will be content to bear the brunt of the current economic depression and the escalating racist brutality, or will they lead a fight back? Anarchists trust the best instincts of the people, and human nature dictates that where there is repression, there will be resistance. Where there is slavery, there will be a struggle against it. The black masses have shown they will fight, and when they organize, they will win. A call for a new black protest movement. Those anarchists who are black like myself recognize there has to be a whole new social movement which is democratic on the grassroots level and is self-activated. It will be a movement independent of the major political parties, the state, and the government. It must be a movement that, although it seeks to expropriate government money for projects that benefits the people, does not recognize any progressive role for the government in the lives of the people. The government will not free us and is a part of the problem rather than a part of the solution. In fact, only the black masses themselves can wage the black freedom struggle, not a government bureaucracy like the U.S. Justice Department or reformist civil rights leaders like Jesse Jackson or a revolutionary vanguard party on their behalf. Of course, at a certain historical moment, a protest leader can play a tremendous revolutionary role as a spokesperson for the people's feelings, or even produce correct strategy and theory for a certain period. For example, Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey, and Martin Luther King Jr. come to mind. And a quote-unquote vanguard party may win mass support and acceptance among the people for a time. For example, the Black Panther Party of the 1960s, but it is the black masses themselves who will make the revolution, and once set spontaneously in motion, will know exactly what they want. Though leaders may be motivated by good or bad, even they will act as a break on the struggle, especially if they lose touch with the freedom aspirations of the black masses. Leaders can only really serve a legitimate purpose as an advisor and catalyst to the movement, and should be subject to immediate recall if they act contrary to the people's wishes. In that kind of limited role, they are not leaders at all. They are community organizers. 
the dependence of the black movement on leaders and leadership, especially the black bourgeoisie, has led us into a political dead end. We are expected to wait and suffer quietly until the next messianic leader asserts himself as if he or she were, quote-unquote, divinely missioned, as some have claimed to be. What is even more harmful is that many black people have adopted a slavish psychology of obeying and serving our leaders without considering what they themselves are capable of doing. Thus, rather than trying to analyze the current situation and carrying on Brother Malcolm X's work in the community, they prefer to bemoan the brutal facts for year after year of how he was taken away from us. Some mistakenly refer to this as a leadership vacuum. The fact is there has not been much movement in the black revolutionary movement since his assassination and the virtual destruction of groups like the Black Panther Party. We have been stagnated by middle-class reformism and misunderstanding. We need to come up with new ideas and revolutionary formations in how to fight our enemies. We need a new mass protest movement. It is up to the black masses to build it, not leaders or political parties. They cannot save us. We can only save ourselves. What form will this movement take? What form will this movement take? If there was one thing learned by anarchist revolutionary organizers in the 1960s, you don't organize a mass movement or a social revolution just by creating one central organization, such as a vanguard political party or a labor union. Even though anarchists believe in revolutionary organization, it is a means to an end instead of the ends itself. In other words, the anarchist groups are not formed with the intention of being permanent organizations to seize power after a revolutionary struggle, but rather to be groups which act as a catalyst to revolutionary struggles and which try to take the people's rebellions, like the 1992 Los Angeles revolt, to a higher level of resistance. Two features of a new mass movement must be the intention of creating dual power institutions to challenge the state, along with the ability to have a grassroots, autonomous movement that can take advantage of a pre-revolutionary situation to go all the way. Dual power means that you organize a number of collectives and communes in cities and towns all over North America, which are, in fact, liberated zones outside of the control of the government. Autonomy means that the movement must be truly independent and a free association of all of those united around common goals, rather than membership as the result of some oath or other pressure. So, how would anarchists intervene in the revolutionary process in black neighborhoods? Well, obviously, North American or quote-unquote white anarchists cannot go into black communities and just proselytize, but they certainly should work with any non-white anarchists and help them work in communities of color. I do think that the example of the New Jersey Anarchist Federation and its loose alliance with the Black Panther movement in that state is an example of how we must start, and we are definitely not talking about a situation where black organizers go into the neighborhood and win people to anarchism so that they can then be controlled by whites and some party. This is how the Communist Party and other Marxist groups operate, but it cannot be how anarchists work. We spread anarchist beliefs not to quote-unquote take over people, but to let them know how they can better organize themselves to fight tyranny and obtain freedom. We want to work with them as fellow human beings and allies who have their own experiences, agendas, and needs. The idea is to get as many movements of people fighting the state as possible, since that is what brings the day of freedom for us all a little closer. 
there needs to be some sort of revolutionary organization for anarchists to work on the local level. So we will call these local groups Black Resistance Committees. Each one of these committees will be Black working class social revolutionary collectives in the community to fight for Black rights and freedom as part of the social revolution. The committees would have no leader or quote unquote party boss and would be without any type of hierarchy structure. It would also be anti authority. They exist to do revolutionary work and thus are not debating societies or a club to elect black politicians to office. They are revolutionary political formations which will be linked with other such groups all over North America and other parts of the world in a larger movement called a federation. A federation is needed to coordinate the actions of such groups, to let others know what is happening in each area, and to set down widespread strategy and tactics. We will call this one, for want of a better name, the African Revolutionary Federation, or it can be part of a multicultural federation. A federation of the sort I am talking about is a mass membership organization which will be democratic and made up of all kinds of smaller groups and individuals. But this is not a government or representative system I am talking about. There would be no permanent positions of power and even the facilitators of internal programs would be subject to immediate recall or have a regular rotation of duties. When a federation is no longer needed, it can be disbanded. Try that with a communist party or one of the major capitalist parties in North America. Revolutionary Strategy and Tactics If we are to build a new black revolutionary protest movement, we must ask ourselves how we can hurt this capitalist system and how have we hurt it in the past when we have led social movements against some aspect of our oppression. Boycotts, mass demonstrations, rent strikes, picketing, work strikes, sit-ins, and other such protests have been used by the black movement at different times in its history, along with armed self-defense and open rebellion. Put simply, what we need to do is take our struggle to a new and higher level. We need to take these tried and true tactics, which have been used primarily on the local level up to this point, and utilize them on a national level and then couple them with as yet untried tactics for a strategic attack on the major capitalist corporations and governmental apparatus. We shall discuss a few of them. A Boycott of American Business It was proven that one of the strongest weapons of the civil rights movement was a black consumer boycott. Merchants and other businessmen, of course, are the leading citizens of any community and the local ruling class and boss of the government. In the 1960s, when blacks refused to trade with merchants as long as they allowed racial discrimination, their loss of revenue drove them to make concessions and mediate the struggle, even hold the cops and the Klan at bay. What is true at the local level is certainly true at the national level. The major corporations and elite families run the country. The government is its mere tool. Blacks spend over $350 billion a year in this capitalist economy as consumers and could just as easily wage economic warfare against the corporate structure with a well-planned boycott to win political concessions. For instance, a corporation like General Motors is heavily dependent upon black consumers, which means that it is very vulnerable to a boycott if one were organized and supported widely. If blacks would refuse to buy GM cars, it would result in significant losses for the corporation to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. Something like this could even bring a company to its knees. Yet the revolutionary wing of the black movement has yet to use boycotts, calling it reformism and outdated. But far from being an outdated tactic that we should abandon, boycotts have become even more effective in the last few years. In 1988, the black and progressive movement in the United States hit on another tactic, 
boycotting the tourist industries of whole cities and states, which engage in discrimination. This reflected on the one hand how many cities have gone from smokestack industries since the 1960s to tourism as their major source of revenue, and on the other hand, a recognition by the movement that economic warfare was a potent weapon against discriminatory governments. The 1990-1993 black boycott against the Miami, Florida tourism industry and the current gay rights boycott against the state of Colorado, started in 1992, have been both successful and have gotten worldwide attention to the problems in their communities. In fact, boycotts have been expanded to cover everything from California grapes, beer, Coors, a certain brand of jeans, all products made in the country of South Africa, a certain meat industry, and many things in between. Boycotts are more popular today than they ever have been. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. recognized the potential revolutionary power of a national black boycott of America's major corporations, which is why he established Operation Breadbasket shortly before an assassin killed him. This organization, with offices in Chicago, was designed to be the conduit for the funds that the corporations were going to be forced to pour money into for a national black community development project for poor communities. And although he was assassinated before this could happen, we must continue his work in this matter. All over the country, black boycott offices should be opened. We should build it into a mass movement involving all sectors of our people. We should demonstrate, picket, and sit in at meetings and offices of target corporations all over the country. We must take it to their very doorstep and stop their looting of the black community. A Black General Strike Because of the role they play in production, black workers are potentially the most powerful sector of the black community in the struggle for black freedom. The vast majority of the black community is working class people. Barring the disproportionate numbers of unemployed, about 11 million black men and women are today part of the workforce of the United States. About 5 to 6 million of these are in basic industries such as steel and metal fabrication, retail trades, food production and processing, meat packing, the automobile industry, railroading, medical service, and communications. Blacks number one-third to one-half of the basic blue-collar workers and one-third of clerical laborers. Black labor is therefore very important to the capitalist economy. Because of this vulnerability to job actions by black workers who are some of the most militant workers on the job, they could take a leading role in a protest campaign against racism and class oppression. If they are properly organized, they would be a class vanguard within our movement since they are at the point of production. Black workers could lead a nationwide general strike at their place of work as a protest against racial discrimination in jobs and housing. The inordinately high levels of black unemployment, brutal working conditions, and to further the demands of the black movement generally. This general strike is a socialist strike, not just a strike for higher wages and over general working conditions. It is revolutionary in politics using other means. This general strike can take the form of industrial sabotage, factory occupations or sit-ins, work slowdowns, wildcat strikes, and other work stoppages as a protest to gain concessions on the local and national level, and restructure the workplace and win the four-hour day for North American labor. The strike would not only involve workers on the job, but also black community and progressive groups to give support with picket line duty, leafleting and publishing strike support newsletters, demonstrations at company offices and work sites, along with other activities. It will take some serious community and workplace organizing to bring a general strike off. In workplaces all over the country, black workers should organize general strike committees at the workplaces and black strike support committees to carry on the strike work inside the black community itself. Because such a strike would be especially hard fought and vicious, black workers should organize workers' defense committees to defend workers fired or blacklisted by the bosses for their industrial organizing work. This defense committee would publicize a victimized worker's case and rally support from other workers 
and the community. The Defense Committee would also establish a labor strike and defense fund and also start food cooperative to financially and materially support such victimized workers and their families while carrying on the strike. Although there will definitely be an attempt to involve women and white workers where they are willing to cooperate, the strike would be under black leadership because only black workers can effectively raise those issues which most affect them. White workers have to support the democratic rights of blacks and other nationally oppressed laborers instead of just white rights campaigns or so-called common economic issues led by the North American left. In addition to progressive North American individuals or union caucuses, the labor union locals themselves should be recruited. But they are not the force to lead this struggle, although their help can be indispensable in a particular campaign. It takes major organizing to make them break free of their racist and conservative nature. So although we want and need the support of our fellow workers, of other nationalities and genders, it is ridiculous and condescending to just tell black workers to sit around and wait for a white workers' vanguard to decide it wants to fight. We will educate our fellow workers to the issues and why they should fight white supremacy at our side, but we will not defer our struggle for anyone. We must organize the general strike for black freedom. The Commune Community Control of the Black Community Quote, How do we raise a new revolutionary consciousness against a system programmed against our old methods? We must use a new approach and revolutionize the black central city commune and slowly provide the people with the incentive to fight by allowing them to create programs which will meet all their social, political, and economic needs and economic needs. We must fill the vacuums left by the established order. In return, we must teach them the benefits of our revolutionary ideals. We must build a subsistence economy and a socio-political infrastructure so that we can become an example for all revolutionary people. End quote. George Jackson from his book, B. The idea behind a mass commune is to create a dual power structure as a counter to the government, under conditions which exist now. In fact, anarchists believe the first step towards self-determination and the social revolution is black control of the black community. This means that black people must form and unify their own organizations of struggle, take control of the existing black communities and all the institutions within them, and conduct a consistent fight to overcome every form of economic, political, and cultural servitude, and any system of racial violence and class inequality which is the product of this racist, capitalist society. The realization of this aim means that we can build inner-city communes which will be centers of black counterpower and social revolutionary culture against the white political power structures in the principal cities of the United States. Once they assume hegemony, such communes would be an actual alternative to the state and serve as a force to revolutionize African people, and by extension large segments of American society which could not possibly remain immune to this process. It would serve as a living revolutionary example to North American progressives and other oppressed nationalities. There is tremendous fighting power in the black community, but it is not organized in a structured revolutionary way to effectively struggle and take what is due. The white capitalist ruling class recognizes this, which is why it pushes the fraud of quote-unquote black capitalism and black politicians and other such responsible leaders. These fakes and sellout artists lead us to the dead-end road of voting and praying for that which we must really be willing to fight for. The anarchists recognize the commune as the primary organ of the new society and as an alternative to the old society. But the anarchists also recognize that capitalism will not give up without a fight it will be necessary to economically and politically cripple capitalist America. One thing for sure, 
we should not continue to passively allow this system to exploit and oppress us. The commune is a staging ground for black revolutionary struggle. For instance, black people should refuse to pay taxes to the racist government, should boycott the capitalist corporations, should lead a black general strike all over the country, and should engage in an insurrection to drive the police out and win a liberated zone. This would be a powerful method to obtain submission to the demands of the movement and weaken the power of the state. We can even force the government to make money available for community development as a concession, instead of as a payoff to buy out the struggle as happened in the 1960s and thereafter. If we put a gun to a banker's head and said, We all know you got the money, now give it up. He would have to surrender. Now, the question is, if we did the same thing to the government using direct action means with an insurrectionary mass movement, would both be acts of expropriation, or is it just to pacify the community why they gave us the money? One thing for sure, we definitely need the money, and however we compel it from the government is of less importance than the fact that we forced them to give it up to the people's forces at all. We would then use that money to rebuild our communities, to maintain our organizations and care for the needs of our people. It could be a major concession, a victory. But we have also got to realize that Africans in America are not simply oppressed by force of arms, but that part of the moral authority of the state comes from the mind of the oppressed, that consent to the right to be governed. As long as black people believe that some moral or political authority of the white government has legitimacy in their lives, that they owe a duty to this nation as citizens, or even that they are responsible for their own oppression, then they cannot effectively fight back. They must free their minds of the ideas of American patriotism and begin to see themselves as a new people. This can only be accomplished under dual power, where the patriotism of the people for the state is replaced with love and support for the new black commune. We do that by making the commune a real thing in the day-to-day -day lives of ordinary people. This has been Anarchism and the Black Revolution, Chapter 2, Part 1, written by Lorenzo Comboa Irvin, read by Sen Naomi Kirschultz.